warm welcome to everyone who has come here this evening for our Monday Thursday evening service. For our order of worship, we'll follow the order that is found printed in the bulletin. Let's begin our service this evening by singing the opening hymn. And that hymn is printed in the Christian Worship Supplement book. It's hymn 717. of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for Monday, Thursday evening is recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. And we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm guessing that it was close to a year ago. I met three of my brothers at my mother's house in Lake Mills, Wisconsin. It was our job that Saturday to clean out the house and to get it ready for sale. Most of the things that my parents owned weren't really worth that much, so most of them went to the local thrift store in Fort Atkinson. My two sisters, of course, had a list of things that they wanted, and so those items were set to the side. I was bound and determined to go up there and to come back without bringing anything with me. And so we were hauling items out of the house, and all of a sudden one of my brothers, who was in my dad's office, trying to clean out my dad's desk, said, Andy, get in here. I just found something. And what did he find? He found something very, very small. A tiny little tie clip that had two emblems on them. Very, very tiny. And upon further inspection, we realized that this tie clip was from Northwestern College. Now, Northwestern College used to be the college that future pastors went to in Watertown, Wisconsin. It was an all-male college. A couple decades ago, that college was merged with Dr. Martin Luther College in New Ulm, Minnesota to form Martin Luther College. Well, it turns out that my grandpa, Theodore Bauer, attended Northwestern College. My father attended Northwestern College, and out of my family of seven, I was the only one to graduate from Northwestern College. So my brother said, here, this is for you. You take this. This is a remembrance for you of dad. Tonight, we have gathered to remember. We have gathered around a remembrance. I suppose if you're looking for the irony in what happens in the upper room, it is that Jesus gives to his disciples a remembrance of himself while he is still alive. Can you imagine how strange his words must have sounded to those disciples? He's talking about his body given, his blood shed, and yet there he sits in front of them, perfectly healthy and whole. Tonight, let's focus our attention on that remembrance that Jesus gave to his disciples. There they are in the upper room, and, and Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. And what is the this? Well, the this is eating unleavened bread and drinking grape wine. 
That's the remembrance of Jesus. Now, as we hear that, we may think to ourselves, well, why would Jesus choose that as his remembrance? If you're at the Passover meal, at least to me, it seems that there would be a much better remembrance for Jesus. And that would be the Passover lamb. After all, the Passover lamb was sacrificed, and soon Jesus would be sacrificed on the cross of Calvary. The Passover lamb, at least in Egypt, had its blood painted on the doorpost so that death would pass over. And Jesus, of course, would shed his blood so that death would pass over. John the Baptist had pointed to Jesus and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But Jesus doesn't choose the Lamb as his remembrance. That was part of the old. Jesus is establishing a new thing, a new covenant. And so what does he choose as his remembrance? Unleavened bread, bread without yeast in it. And of course, yeast was a symbol for sin. Jesus, the bread of life, the one without sin. He chooses also grape wine. It's a reminder, a significance of the fact that he would soon shed his blood to pay for the sins of the world. Jesus chooses unleavened bread and he chooses grape wine as the remembrance that he gives to his disciples. But of course there's more there than just bread and wine. There are really four things there, right? There's bread and wine, but according to Jesus' own words, he says, there is also his body and his blood. Every evangelical in America would agree that in the Lord's Supper there's bread and wine, but then they would say, that's it. And Catholics in America, if they were trained properly according to their faith, would say there's no bread and wine because the priest has changed the substance of the bread and wine into Christ's body and blood. In the Lord's Supper, there are four things, bread and wine, and Christ's body and blood. And the body and blood are received by God's people as we make use of the bread and the wine according to Christ's command. This is the remembrance that has been passed along, passed down to us. Just think about that. Here we are this evening, 2,000 years after Jesus gave this remembrance to his disciples. And here we are, 2,000 years later, still receiving that remembrance that he gave to his apostles. This has been passed along, and as Paul writes in our text, he passed along to the Corinthians what he received from the Lord Jesus. Now, the Apostle Paul was not in that upper room when Jesus gave the Lord's Supper. He was probably somewhere in the city of Jerusalem as a devout Jew, there for the Passover. He was probably there with some of his buddies discussing the Jesus problem, trying to figure out how to get rid of this guy. Kind of like, you know, the way today the establishment Republicans are talking about how to get rid of that guy named Trump. But he did meet the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. That's when he became a Christian. And after that, we're told that he was instructed by the Lord Jesus. And so the Lord Jesus gave to him this remembrance. And in our text, he says he's passing along this remembrance to the people, the believers in the city of Corinth as well. What does he say about that remembrance? He says something very unique about it. He says that that remembrance serves as a proclamation of the Lord's death. Not too long ago, another one of those sad surveys came out that indicates that America is even more ungodly and unchristian than we thought that the secularization of our country is happening at an even faster pace than anyone imagined. Well, praise be to God that in that setting, he puts his people. And as we receive this remembrance in the form of bread and wine, Christ's body and blood, we really are proclaiming his death until he returns. 
It's a wordless proclamation, but when God's people come forward to receive Holy Communion, you are making a proclamation that Christ died for me. Christ shed his blood for me. And that proclamation is so desperately needed in our day and age today. The simple teaching about the Lord's Supper is, as we have often called it, the teaching of the real presence. The real presence means that somehow, in a way that we don't understand, Christ's true body and blood are in, with, and under the bread and the wine. That his body and blood are really present. And that this sacrament is a real and precious remembrance that Christ has given to his people on earth. You know, I have to tell you about this remembrance. As of 24 hours ago, I didn't know where it was. I knew that I had gotten it about a year ago, but I, don't, I didn't know what had happened to it. It's small, easy to lose. So when I went on a frantic search last night. Searched in the bedroom, searched where I thought it might be found, started emptying those coin containers in the kitchen, and sure enough, that's where I found it. Buried in quarters, nickels, and dimes. That's the way it is with a remembrance. You can misplace it, right? Forget about it. Maybe that's what's going on tonight. Where are God's people if they are making use of the remembrance that God has given to his church? Eh, forgot about it. Out of sight, out of mind. Or what about this kind of remembrance? What if a grandma wills to her daughter her precious imported china set and the, the daughter puts that beautiful china set on display. But one day the grandkids are running through the house and they knock over the display and the entire thing crashes and all the china is destroyed. That remembrance has been destroyed. That remembrance has been ruined. There's really no way to destroy the remembrance that Christ has given to his church on earth. However, it can be abused. And this is the reason that Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthians. Someone came to him with a laundry list of problems in the congregation, and he addressed them one by one. And one of the problems had to do with the Lord's Supper. Evidently, when Christians would get together, they would have an agape meal or a love feast, and there were abuses at these meals. People were pushing and shoving to get to the front of the line. There was dissension and disagreement. Paul writes that some were even getting drunk, and he says about this, I have no praise concerning this, concerning what is going on in your congregation. You can't destroy or damage the re remembrance that Jesus has given, but you can do damage to yourself if you receive it, Paul writes, in an unworthy manner. And what does that mean, to receive the remembrance in an unworthy manner? Well, first of all, this remembrance is only for believers, and not even for all believers, only those who have been thoroughly instructed in God's word. The remembrance is not for little children. It's for believers who have been thoroughly instructed. Just think about this. Jesus didn't give the Lord's Supper this remembrance until after three years of intensive instruction that he had given to his disciples. The remembrance is for the baptized. The remembrance is for those who have been instructed. And specifically, Paul writes in our text, it's for those who acknowledge or recognize the body and blood of Christ. It's for those who believe in the real presence. Those who are unworthy recipients are those who don't acknowledge the real presence or who are impenitent, who say to themselves, you know, I haven't sinned, I haven't done anything wrong, I'm a holy person. The Lord's Supper is not for such a person because the spiritual blessing of the Lord's Supper is forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. 
And when a, co a person comes impenitent, they come in an unworthy way. The truth is that the body and blood of Christ are in the Lord's Supper, whether you believe it or not. And if you don't believe it, you eat and drink judgment on yourself. You're not sinning against bread and wine. You can't do that. You're sinning against the body and blood of the Lord, as Paul writes, and you're bringing judgment on yourself. And so this is a very, very serious matter, according to what the Apostle Paul writes. And since it is such a serious matter, we here at our church and other Wells churches practice close or closed communion. That means we welcome to the Lord's Supper those who have fellowship with God, a vertical fellowship, but also those who have a horizontal fellowship with us, are in agreement in teaching with us. A couple of weeks ago, there was a visitor here at church, and I knew that she was not Wisconsin Synod. It was a communion Sunday, and I guess I've gotten to the point where I want to be preemptive in my approach to our practice of close communion. So before church, I said, listen, uh, today, as you can see, we're having the Lord's Supper, and this is our practice at our church, that, that our members and only our members are welcome at the Lord's table, and here's why we have this practice. Because we believe that in the Lord's Supper we receive Christ's body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. But people can also receive that in an unworthy manner. Not as a blessing, but as a judgment on themselves. And we don't want that latter thing to be true for anyone. We want as many people to come to the Lord's Supper as possible. But first we want to make sure that they know what they are receiving and why they are receiving it namely, for the forgiveness of all of their sins. So, I have a pin as a remembrance of my dad. I have something else as well, besides photos. There's one other thing that somebody put in my truck before I left Lake Mills, and that was a table saw. <laughs> a table saw that my dad never used. <laughs> that he probably picked up at a rummage sale, a table saw with broken legs. So in remembrance of him, I fixed it up and mounted it on a nice stand and have used it for cutting up pine cars. The one thing that I have though that is probably the most precious is that pin. But it wasn't given to me. My dad died suddenly. Didn't have a chance to give anyone anything. It was given to me by my brother who found it in a desk drawer. But Jesus has given to you a remembrance of him. He's given it to you in the same way he gave it to those apostles that were with him in that upper room. And it indeed is a precious remembrance of him. A remembrance of his saving work for you. He gave his life for you. He shed his blood for you. He doesn't want you to forget that. And that's why he gives you his same body and blood in the Lord's Supper. Don't misplace it. Don't forget about it. Don't wreck it. Don't inflict harm on yourself, but receive it. And in doing so, continue to do what God's people have always done. That is to proclaim our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's death until he returns. Because we know something, and that is this, that in his death we have life. Amen. The peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. In this Lenten season, we have heard again how our Lord walked the path of suffering which led him to the cross for our salvation. We have also heard our Lord's call to intensify our struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and one another. This is the struggle to which we were committed at baptism. God's forgiveness and the power of his spirit to amend our lives continue with us because of his love for us in Jesus our Savior. Within the family of the church, God never wearies of giving peace and new life. In the absolution, we receive forgiveness as from God himself. 
This absolution we should not doubt, but firmly believe that our sins are thus forgiven before God in heaven, for it comes to us in the name and by the command of our Lord. We who receive God's love in Jesus Christ are called to love one another, to be servants to each other, as Jesus became our servant. In Holy Communion, the members of Christ's body participate most intimately in his love. Remembering our Lord's Last Supper with his disciples, we eat the bread and drink the cup of this meal. Together we receive the Lord's gift of his body and blood for forgiveness and participate in that new covenant that makes us one with him and one another. The Lord's Supper is the promise of the great banquet we will share with all the faithful when our Lord returns, the joyous culmination of our reconciliation with God and each other. Let us confess our sins to God and ask for his forgiveness. Almighty God, merciful Father, I confess to you that I have not loved you with all my heart. In what I have done and left undone, I have pursued my ways instead of your ways. I have not loved my brothers and sisters as myself. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. I am truly sorry for my sins. I repent of them. I beg for your mercy, O Lord. Forgive us for the sake of Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for us. Cleanse me from my sins. Release me from my guilt. Grant me your Holy Spirit to amend my sinful life. The Almighty God has been merciful to us and has sent his Son to die for all. For his sake, God forgives our sins and calls us from darkness to his marvelous light. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven us and reconciled us to God and has promised us the power to forgive and love each other. Relying on his promise, therefore, be reconciled with one another. Brothers and sisters, may the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, in our words, and in our actions. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, in the sacrament of Holy Communion, you give us your true body and blood as a remembrance of your suffering and death on the cross. Grant us so firmly to believe your words and promise that we may always partake in this sacrament to our eternal good. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first scripture reading is the Old Testament lesson recorded in Jeremiah chapter 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Here ends the first scripture lesson. We sing Psalm 116 as it's printed in the bulletin. presence of the Lord in the land of the living. 
I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The Lord is gracious and righteous. When I was in great need, he saved me. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. God of mercy and might, through the resurrection of your Son, you have freed us from the anguish of guilt and bonds of death. Be with us on our pilgrimage and help us glorify you in the presence of all your people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The second scripture lesson is recorded in the book of Hebrews chapter 10. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Here ends the second scripture lesson. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Until he comes. Until he comes. Until he comes. 
Please rise for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is recorded in Luke chapter 22. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished, make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Here ends the Holy Gospel. We continue by singing the hymn of the evening, which is printed in the bulletin.
Our Savior Jesus Christ, God provided us with the Passover lamb to save us from eternal death when he sent you into our world and sacrificed you on the cross for our sins. O oh, work true repentance in our hearts, causing us to make sincere confession of our sins and to believe with joyful trust that he has forgiven us for your sake. May your body and blood given and shed for our sins and imparted to us here this evening in bread and wine in that supper which commemorates your death ever nourish our faith, cheer our hearts, and strengthen our will to, give God, to live godly and upright lives. Gracious Lord, drive all, out all hypocrisy from our hearts and grant to each one a heart truly set upon you and lips that make bold and honest declarations of your name to others. Do not allow Satan to rob us of the treasures of heaven by tempting us to love the treasures and pleasures of this world. As you went resolutely forth to meet the enemy intent on doing the Father's will, so may we be set to obey him in everything so that what pleases him pleases us. By your spirit, help us to watch and pray at all times and to be fully aware of the weaknesses of our flesh. And if the time of victory over our sinful flesh and the wicked world seems long in coming and the evil on every hand depresses us, teach us to find joy and courage through believing your promises of everlasting salvation. Precious Redeemer, may your face that once reflected the burden of our sins and the anguish of hell be ever turned toward us in love and tenderness. Let no one in this Christian assembly who has known you as friend and Lord as well as Savior ever betray your love. And may the dear blood once shed for us be for our sins the perfect cleansing power. Hear us to the glory of your holy name and hear us as we join in praying. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus has given us a holy supper in which we receive his true body and blood for the forgiveness of sins and the strengthening of our faith. In this supper we celebrate the gift of his redemption. We bear witness to the fellowship we share as confessors of the truth and we proclaim his death until he returns. <coughs> that Jesus was betrayed. He took the bread and then he prayed. He broke and gave them up the bread. And unto his disciples said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then when the sacred meal was o'er, our blessed Savior spoke once more. He offered thanks and lifted up to give to all the blessed cup. Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. O Lamb of God, you take away the sins of all. Now hear us pray and grant us from our sins release. See, us grant us peace. There will be no hymn during the distribution. All things are now ready, let us come.
the true body of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for all of your sins. Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. May this same body and blood strengthen you and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for all of your sins. Take and drink. the true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. May this same body and blood strengthen you and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Gentile 
most promised light, God's glory dwelling in our midst, the joy of Israel. We give you heartfelt thanks for the holy gifts you have bestowed upon us in bread and wine. Guide and direct us continuously in our journey to the cross that we may behold both your anguish in crucifixion and your joy in resurrection. Amen. Amen. The closing hymn is hymn 315. Great marriage feast of bliss and love. 